So what may you ask is the Great American Songbook? Well, you're here, so I know that you have an interest in it, but I'd like to give you my definition or interpretation of what the songbook is. We're not even sure exactly when that term, Great American Songbook, came into usage, but many people connected with Ella Fitzgerald and her iconic recordings of Great American Standards starting in 1956. This body of music is something that ranges from the late 1800s all the way up to the 21st century. And for me, a broad definition of what becomes part of the Great American Songbook is that it's an enduring piece of music. It's an enduring standard, which means that it is played for succeeding generations and continues to have resonance and pertinence and feeling and meaning for people as time goes by, which is a very popular song written in 1931 that I'm not going to sing for you right now, but you can look it up. And that's one of the wonderful things about the world today is that we can discover so much music on the internet. And while it is absolutely great, it's also overwhelming. So we are focusing on a body of work that I think is the finest music and lyrics created in our United States in, the, in primarily the 20th century. I say that because I believe that there are songs that are created today that will become a permanent part of the Great American Songbook. That is determined by time, because if in 25 years a song that is popular today is known broadly and sung and recorded by everybody in decades to come, then that means that it has found a permanent place in the songbook. Now, the one thing that I love about these classic songs is that they are the perfect combination of music and lyric. Putting the two together presents, uh, presents a song that you cannot think of the music without the lyric or the lyric without the music. You can't separate them when you hear them like Somewhere over the rainbow when you hear you hear the lyric, or when you say somewhere over the rainbow, you hear the music. And that's because it's the perfect melding. The lyricists, Marilyn and Alan Bergman, always said that when they were given a tune by a composer to write words for, they always felt like those words were already written somewhere out there in the ether, and it was just up to them to sort of find it and channel it and put it with that music, as if it cosmically had already been done. And that's the reason that these songs endure, because the craft of what they did is, is exquisite, and they always used proper rhymes, and it's a form that is such perfection that it's death-defying to consider how many great songs were written, thousands and thousands of, and thousands of them by so many different songwriters. And these songwriters were people that were usually writing songs for a specific situation, for a play or for a film, or for some other incidents that was for commerce, but it is the inspiration that comes through in all of these songs. And one of the things I find fascinating is the way that these songs can be interpreted in many different ways. And that'll be the fun, I think, of exploration for you. For example, in 1920, Irving Berlin wrote a song called You'd Be Surprised. He wrote it for a vaudevillian named Eddie Cantor, who was kind of a uh, a bug-eyed comedian who was kind of wacky, and he wrote this song for Eddie Cantor, and it went, I'm not so good in a crowd, but when you get me alone, you'd be surprised. So it was a self-deprecating song about how, hey, I may, I may not look like much, but when you get me alone, <laughs> you'd be surprised. And then 30 years later, Irving Berlin took that same song and suggested it for the great sex kitten Marilyn Monroe who sang it in a very different way. But Irving Berlin understood that he could take that exact song and it could be interpreted completely differently when Marilyn Monroe sang it in a sexy way. I'm not so good in a crowd, but when you get me alone, you'd be surprised. So it's the exact same music and lyrics, but it takes on a completely different meaning. And that's one of the fun things about it. The other thing that you'll discover, if you haven't already, is that you can also interpret these songs very differently in tempo and in feeling. You can do a song up-tempo or you can do it as a ballad. The same music and lyrics and finding what fits you is one of the joys of this repertoire. Even the song Over the Rainbow 
almost didn't get written because the first time the composer, Harold Arlen, played it for E.Y. Yip Harburg, who wrote the lyric, Yip Harburg didn't like it because Arlen said, I've got this tune that this little girl in Kansas has to sing about her longing, and he played. And, and Yip Harburg said, that doesn't in any way reflect what a little girl would feel that's just too ponderous. And Ira Gershwin, who was sitting and observing, watching his two friends work on the song, said, Harold, play that tune again, but play it in a more gentle, popular style. And Harold played. And then when Yip heard that, he said, oh, yeah, that would be great for that spot. And that's when he came up with the idea of Over the Rainbow. So that is a perfect example of how these songs can morph and can be, and can be tailored to you.